Guten Abend, good evening from Hamburg. My name is Kim Wünschmann and I'm the director of the Institute for the History of the German Jews here in Hamburg. I'm delighted to be co-hosting this event um, with Professor Simon May, who will speak to us about his book, How to Be a Refugee, One Family Story of Exile and Belonging, published by Picador. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. Toby Simpson, uh, the director of the Wiener Holocaust Library, will probably introduce Simon. But before that, let me say that it gives me really great pleasure to hold this event uh, with Simon and with our dear colleagues and friends from the Wiener Holocaust Library in London. In post-Brexit times and in the light of the various crises we are living through, these transnational corporations does not necessarily get easier with the overall difficult political atmosphere in which we are working. And this makes it, in our view, even more important to establish and to strengthen such international links, uh, in particular, as Simon's book gives the strongest reason for pursuing a very fruitful and meaningful uh, German-British exchange. So we, we thoroughly believe in the benefits of such an exchange, and we seize the advantages of the virtual space so that we can come together and hold this very special book talk. Welcome all. The Institute for the History of the German Jews, for those of you who do not yet know us, was established in 1966 as the first research institution in West Germany dedicated entirely to German Jewish history. And traditionally, scholars at the Institute work on the extensive archival materials documenting a more than 400 year history of the Jews in the Hamburg region, including the history of a Sephardic community who settled in the city in the late 16th century. Uh, today, the focus of our research is um, on a wider and broader history, culture, and religion of German speaking Jewry in the period from early modern to present times. We understand Jewish history as an integral part of general history and our research connects to larger and interdisciplinary trends on the study of, of migration, gender, education, or violence. And on these themes, we hold regular public lectures and events such as the one tonight. Um, we also engage with community-based initiatives in the city of Hamburg and beyond such as, for example, the, the Stolpersteine Initiative, active to commemorate the victims of Nazi tyranny with by now more than 6,000 of these stumbling blocks that can be found in the streets of Hamburg. And we have a thriving community of students from the University of Hamburg with whom we work in teaching and learning about German Jewish history. And some of them are also here in the audience tonight. Like our colleagues in London, we seek to encourage young people's interest in history, and we are uh, convinced that it's really worth studying and perhaps also struggling with the painful and the troubled histories of the 20th century as they hold uh, such great relevance to our own present. So tonight we'll surely talk about generations and how every generation poses new questions to the past to address these broader and I think burning issues of identity and belonging and of lives that unfold between individual design and external pressures. So without further ado, I hand over to Toby. Thank you, Kim, and welcome everyone from London. My name is Toby Simpson, and I'm the director of the Wiener Holocaust Library. And we're so happy to be working with the Hamburg Institute for the History of the German Jews to bring this event to you this evening. Uh, very much looking forward to my conversation with Simon. For those of you who may not have heard of the Wiener Holocaust Library, it's one of the world's most comprehensive collections relating to the Holocaust, and uh, uh, indeed it has many collections relating to other genocides. And it was founded uh, in 1933 in Amsterdam um, and moved to London in 1939. It's become, uh, over time, very much a, a diverse collection and an active collection. And the people working at the library, including its founder, Alfred Wiener, were very concerned to confront and record, um, to confront fascism and antisemitism and record the crimes of uh, the Nazis in particular. So uh, I'm delighted to be here this evening. And I will also introduce the, uh, our, our main guest for tonight's event, Simon May. And we are absolutely 
uh, looking forward to discussing his fantastic book, How to Be a Refugee, which I have with me here, and uh, very much recommend everyone, of course, to read it. Uh, it is indeed a gripping story of how one family hid their Jewish origins to survive the Nazis. And uh, for those of you who haven't come across Simon's work, he's a professor of philosophy who has published several books, um, including, for example, books on Nietzsche's ethics and love, a new understanding of an ancient emotion. Um, but this book is, is in quite a different vein. It's very personal history, but it brings all of his, of course, intellectual rigor and, and insight to it. And uh, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, to, to begin, actually, I, I thought it might be worth me mentioning a, a little bit about the library's founder, Alfred Wiener, because the, one of the things that struck me most when reading this book was that it touched on many of the complex issues around the relationship between German identity, Jewish identity, and what it is like to be a refugee. And that's kind of at the heart of the book, but it also builds a fant fascinating picture of a lost world of, of Berlin. And Berlin for, for many years was, was the home of Alfred Wiener, who, who founded the library and where I work. So uh, one way that I think would be put, sort of the perfect way to start this conversation, Simon, if you'll allow me, is just to ask me, uh, sorry, to ask you to, to, to sort of bring us into that world which you evoke in the book as, as, as you uncover the complex and fascinating history of your family. Um, and that world is, 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 is located in, in Berlin. So I wonder if you could just paint a bit of a picture of that for us. Sure. Um, anyway, hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I think the, the key word that summarizes that world, as far as certainly my family and their friends were concerned, is solidity. Uh, and this word was repeated endlessly uh, by my mother, by her sisters. And I think if we imagine ourselves back, say, into the year 1932, uh, you know, my grandparents sort of seem to have it all. I mean, they seem to have reached an extraordinary level of flourishing in what was the capital of the German Reich and, and in a sense, beyond the imaginings of any of their ancestors. And my grandfather was the beneficiary of a long process of assimilation that German Jews had undergone since 1812. Uh, obviously a very rocky road, but still a very, a road with, uh, in a sense, a very clear direction. And, you know, they had a large 12 bedroom apartment in a road that got bombed off the map called Blumershof. And in fact, the actual number of Blumershof, which was 12, number 12, happened to be the very building that Walter Benjamin discusses uh, in his um, memoir of his childhood in Berlin where his grandmother lived, uh, which was right above my own grandparents. Um, and uh, this was a house where Christmas was celebrated, as it was in the Freud's house in Vienna and in many other such homes. Um, it was a house of visiting artists and musicians, um, like, the music, like the cellist uh, Gregor Piatigorsky, very distinguished musicians would come, poets. And there was a sense that belonging to the Bildungsbürgertum and high German culture was a form of safety as well as being venerated beyond any Jewish heritage. So in some ways, uh, the Jewish heritage was like a ladder that had enabled them to climb to these heights of assimilation into German culture and which could at this point be disposed of. Um, and so a sense of great security, you know, despite obviously anti-Semitism and so on never having gone away, a sense of extraordinary security existed. Uh, yes. and somehow this ethic of seriousness and learning and music and philosophy and so on would, you know, had enabled them to reach this position, which was in a sense unassailable. So yes. I think that's a sort of summary. And so the Liedke family had a strong sense of who they were, but also perhaps a strong sense of who they weren't. And you introduced this idea of the Bildungsbürgertum, and in your book you sort of set that against the idea of being Spiesig or the Spiesig. Uh, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about 
what the Leapers felt they weren't as well as what they felt they were. Well, they certainly felt they weren't Spiesig, um, which is a word that's very difficult to translate into English. Um, um, narrow, in a sense, devoted to comfort, um, you know, closed. I'm not sure how else really to describe it. The other thing that they weren't, well, this is complicated, but the other thing that in some ways they weren't was Jewish. As I've just said, the Jewish heritage was seen as one that could now be dispensed with. Um, and this was a kind of, this is a very difficult process to describe because this is not just a matter of an external way of living, like, you know, the conversos say in 15th century Iberia, you know, where they outwardly converted to Christianity, but many of them inwardly remained Jewish. This was a kind of purging of the spirit. It was a sort of, if I can use that dreadful term, a kind of internal ethnic cleansing. I mean, that's putting it very dramatically, but not too dramatically. Um, because the strangeness about this consciousness, which I think is not appreciated widely, even in Germany today. In fact, in many ways, I found that people don't want to hear about it because of a very well-established narrative about uh, Jews in Germany and as it were, and their, their fate. But essentially there was a, an almost no longer a recognition of being Jewish. And at the same time, of course, there was. So this is a very, very difficult identity to describe. I attempt to do it in my book. Yes. Um, well, I, actually, I thought maybe music is an interesting example of that. And I, the reason I introduce music as a theme is partly because it was so important to the, the, the sisters who feature at the centre of the book. But that's also, I suppose, music has such a strong tradition in German Jewish culture. And it, it, but at the same time, it is um, very internal. Um, it, it doesn't require kind of labelling necessarily. So I just wonder if you might want to say a few words about the, what music meant to the family. Well, music was uh, music was really the religion. I mean, the family had converted to initially Protestantism, um, and then later the three daughters became Catholic. But music was, in a sense, the the real religion, and there was a sense that it was. Now, of course, German music was the height of music. And that somehow the, the love of music and the loyalty to German music was part of this feeling of security um, and this feeling that, as it were, there was something that could transcend the ordinariness of everyday life. And also the ugliness, including racist ugliness of everyday life. So I think music had a sort of transcendental force that, that, that in a sense was, was one of the reasons for this sense of security. Yes. It might be good to turn to the three sisters now who form such a central part in this book, each of whom has an absolutely fascinating story. So I'd love to spend, if you'll allow me, a bit of time with each of them. But, but sure. a good way to maybe lead into the story of the sisters is to talk about music, which would have been important to all of them. Well, yes. I mean, uh, in a sense, uh, music was the was you know as a, was the common solvent in a sense of their identity, but at the same time, they each took extremely different paths. So I think it's necessary to say that the kind of crucial event that kicked off their very different trajectories was the death of their father, who was summarily thrown out of work in April 1933 um, and died a few months later, simply from, I think, the strain of it all. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was that, unlike many families where this disaster caused people to return to their Jewish roots, the exact opposite happened. So they all at various stages during the 30s became Catholic. Um, that was the last thing, as it were, that they had in common. I mean, then they diverged greatly. So my mother's middle sister, there were three sisters. My mother was the youngest. Uh, and the middle sister was called Orzel. And she was a young actress who was expelled from her first job in 
1935, you know, when that initial raft of race laws um, had been enacted and she was, all, all artists would had to become part of the Reiskulturkammer and for that you had to produce ethnic evidence and so on. And she um, could not do that, so she was thrown out. Um, but amazingly, uh, during the war, she was successfully Aryanized. I don't know if you, those of you who are familiar with that process, which was extremely rare, uh, was rare to be successful. She was helped by one of Goebbels's deputies, a man called Hans Hinkel, um, who was actually at one point in charge of the whole high school tour comer. And this came through a connection with Ige Farben, which I detail in my book. I mean, I won't go into all the details now, but it was quite an extraordinary it, it um, is absolutely extraordinary if we, achievement. We, could, we should definitely come back to that in a second. We'll come back it to it. So, ex, ex, extraordinary episode, but I, I just think that perhaps it is. Worth, second, uh, yeah. So, so, so that was. Sorry, go on. Sorry, just to say, just a second on the the point about the uh, what happened to Ernst, and then also what happened to Ursula in, in thirty five, and a, it's sort of the rapidity of this. So we've we, it's yeah. an incredibly solid life life of this build of. Bogotum. And um, in Ernst's case as well, you know, the, the court where he was employed was, you know, the shock of, of lose, losing his job, the rapidity of all this is, is, is just quite astonishing. That's right. So as I said, I mean, we're talking about April 33, which was just, uh, you know, three months uh, or less after Hitler came to power. And um, in fact, he worked at a court in a street in Berlin called the Elsterstrasse, which is remains a court to this day and is I, I'm told Germany's oldest surviving court. So it's still in business. Very grand building. It's it is indeed. And it was around the corner from my mother's school, um, which is also still a functioning school. In fact, I visited it with her once. Um, and as a, yes, as you said, I mean, he was, but like many other Jews, of course, um, he was thrown out of work. And obviously there was no such thing as social security in those days. And uh, so he lived off savings until he basically faced bankruptcy. Um, and at that point he died. Um, so so uh, his, but his daughters, so to speak, kept, kept going. I mean, Orzel tried to continue her, her nascent career. I mean, she was obviously only a very, very young actress. But as I say, she, uh, she was no longer able to work after 1935. The oldest sister was called Ilza. Uh, she had a very different trajectory because she was, firstly, she was privately, she was self, um, she was self-employed, so to speak, as a photographer. But she also was engaged, although nothing ever happened about it, uh, to a card-carrying Nazi who was not a, according to my family, a particularly convinced member of the party, but he had joined before 1933. I think he joined in 31. Um, so uh, I assume, I mean, at that point, there wasn't such a benefit to join the party in career terms. So I take it, he must have had some degree of conviction. But in any event, the likelihood is that he protected her and somehow enabled her to keep going and but none of us really under, understand it to this day, how she really managed, because uh, as things got worse during the 30s and then into the 40s, she lived a completely open and free life. Indeed, she very much mixed with um, actors and, uh, for example, was, was known to go to parties in Babelsberg, which was obviously infested with Nazis. So somehow she survived this whole process absolutely unscathed and always said to me that she was never afraid until the Russians entered Berlin, which I found quite incredible. In it's both incredible. I mean, her fearlessness is, is extraordinary. And I think one of the great strengths of your book is the way that the character of these sisters comes across, their personalities. Um, and in Ilse's case, that extraordinary fearlessness is sort of hard to grasp, but you make it um, very, very tangible by the way you describe, by the way you paint her character. Well, I mean, I was always fascinated, you know, by my family. So I kind of, uh, you know, interrogated them from childhood onwards. And I found Ilza's case particularly extraordinary because mm. uh, until really she died, 
you never felt that sense of fear. I mean, it really only broke out when she was vulnerable and ill, you know, in the last year of her life. Um, and to me, she always said, I never had any fear at all. Indeed, it has to be said that she also spent much of the war actually hiding Jews um, in, with somebody who became, whose memoir became very well known after the war called Christabel Bielenberg, um, who was actually an Anglo-Irish woman living in Berlin, but that's a whole other story. But so she, she not only lived completely openly, but she actually, so to speak, hid people like herself, um, which I speculate might have even reinforced the sense that she wasn't one of them. But that's, that's perhaps a slightly mean speculation, but it is such an extraordinary story. The third yeah. sister, who was my mother, just to sort of finish the brief summary, um, who was the youngest of the sisters, had a very, very different trajectory. Um, and she was studying, she was studying to become a violinist. I mean, all three daughters, which was also unusual, I think, for those days, were embarking on professions. So Ilza, the photographer, Orzel, the actress, and my mother, the violinist. And my mother's violin teacher um, was a man called Max Rostal, who was a very young professor at the Berlin Hochschule, which was the one of the great centers of musical learning in the world at that time. And he was Jewish and was he was already a professor, I think, at 24. And he was thrown out, obviously, um, and managed to get a visa to go to England. So he actually took my mother with him. Um, and very recently, uh, this is not in the book because it's just happened quite recently, I was contacted by an archivist from Berlin who, who is actually in charge of Rostal's archive. Um, and uh, she said to me, you know, are you the grandson of Ernst Lieke? So I said, I am. And she'd found out my name by various means I needn't go into now. Um, and she said, well, look, I have a letter here in Rostal's archive, which he must have kept all those decades from your grandfather, begging him, begging Rostal to take my mother to England and basically saying, I'm afraid as people like us, he said to Rostal in um, Leute wie wir or something like that, we, of course, can no longer earn a living. So you will understand that I cannot pay for my daughter's lessons. Uh, and I would be, you know, deeply indebted to you if you could teach her for nothing and take her with you to England. So this is, and I just, I mean, this, I've just, this letter was just made uh, available to me. So she went to England and lived a completely different life to her sisters. I mean, she was immersed in the German and Austrian Jewish um, community here, which was, of course, quite a large and a very thriving community. And, um, you know, she really, really never moved outside that community ever in her life. I mean, that was one of the ironies of this intense assimilation was that, in fact, she only really felt at home with her fellow refugees. Mm. Um, so those are the three, a summary of the three trajectories. It's uh, fascinating. And actually, one of the things I wondered is that, of course, um, the person who you lived in closest proximity was not the three sisters, was of course, your your mother. Yeah. Um, and yet, at the same time, you opened the book with this extraordinary moment of you discovering a new layer of your own identity through your aunts. So I just wondered a little bit about... Um, about that, that, un that uncovering and uh, also what perhaps... It, how it how it changed the way you you looked at your family well essentially entirely um so 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 i want to sort of bring you in, into the picture a little bit yes well i mean one of the most uh, decisive moments in my life i mean you know uh, not just in retrospect but i almost knew it at the time was when the middle aunt i've referred to orzel the actress who really was an actress in daily life as much as she had been professionally, um, said to me when I was 11, I was with her and Ilza in a chalet in Switzerland. We all, all the sisters had been there, the three sisters, but my mother had gone back to England for various reasons. She'd had to go back. And Orzel suddenly turned to me and said to me, do you know how your father really died? Now, my father was also a German Jew, 
who'd been born in Cologne from actually quite a religious family, um, originally from Trier. And his ancestors, you will find in the graveyard that exists in Trier to this day, uh, also, you know, the Marxes and Karl Marx's family and ancestors and so on. Anyway, she said, do you know how your father really died? And I then discovered from her as she actually imitated, she happened to be in the room when it happened. He died of a sudden heart attack, uh, age 57, in the German embassy of all places in London. And she told me this story. And for some reason, my father, I was only six when he died, but his memory had been more or less erased and he was never spoken of. And this, so to speak, set me this question, which appalled Ilza, who was present. She said, you know, how can you talk to a child, ask, you know, tell a child this and imitate his father's death in front of him, you know, you will traumatize him, but it did exactly the opposite. It made me deeply curious and deeply grateful to her for, so to speak, having restituted him in a kind of way, and having set me then off a sort of path of searching for him, and in the process of searching for him, of searching for who I was, as one does. I mean, one's parents are such a decisive, obviously, determination of who one is. And I vaguely knew he was also had been German, and I vaguely remember my parents only talking in German, but I really knew nothing about him. So this was sort of set me off. I know one isn't allowed to use the term fatherland anymore, uh, but um, I mean, it's because it you know rhymes, so to speak, I mean, it set me off on a course of looking for my father, but also for his land mm. and what it meant to me and what it meant to my family and why it still meant so much to my family decades after the war. Yeah. You know, why they, why they couldn't get over having lost it. Mm. It wasn't just that they couldn't get over the Holocaust or couldn't get over racial persecution or even couldn't get over the deaths in their families, um, including my great uncle, my mother's uncle, who was deported to Auschwitz. They couldn't get over the loss of exactly this world that I spoke about in answer to your first question. So the loss of this, you know, of this German world, if you like, well, not if you like, German world, uh, with all the, you know, with all the culture and so on, and they just basically never got over it. Yes. I wonder what it must have been like for you to discover the stories of your mother, your aunt, your father, that they were all so extraordinary. I mean, I, I suppose this actually probably does happen to several people who who, who yeah. look back on this history. But but as you say, think the episodes like the 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 role Hinkle played in in um, Ursel uh, Ursel's story that, that must have been quite extraordinary to discover these kinds of this this, this hidden history. Yes, I mean. Um... As I say, you know, I was sort of set off on this path by this. It was just a catalyst, but it was an essential. Perhaps it wasn't essential. Perhaps I would have done it anyway, but it was at quite a young age of 11. Mm. Um, and I just developed this intense curiosity. And I always wanted to, it was like a detective, you know, a process of uncovering something that was, it wasn't secret. In fact, my, 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 my mother, for example, couldn't stop talking about these stories, but I wanted to know every single detail. And uh, so I also interrogated my aunts. And from, you know, I also wanted to know why they lived in Germany still. I don't know if I've, I don't think I've mentioned that yet, but both my aunts lived in Germany until they died. Um, Orzel had fled to Holland. Um, after, anyway, this is, a, this is a whole story. She was, her aryanization went up in smoke very quickly and she fled to Holland where her husband was in the German army of all things but um uh you know i i just interrogated wazel um, uh, um who who spoke perhaps most liberally of all and she told me the hinkle story but it was only much later thanks to kim wunschmann that i discovered or she discovered um you know that that there is a trace of this story in the archives in the bundesarch even berlin and above all, which my aunt had never told me about, a very personal letter to Hans Hinkle, thanking him for having given her her life back. It's a very moving letter. Uh, and 
it confirms, which is a still a mystery to me, how a completely unknown young actress would be given the time of day. I mean, she was received in his in his office on multiple occasions in the Ministry of you know, Propaganda. Um, and it was clear that he was, I mean, she always told me he was the one who affected the aerianization. What his motives were, we don't really know. But, you know, it was extraordinary to find that letter. Very moving. Absolutely. And one of the things that I also find extraordinary is that, of course, there are still gaps, but often the gaps do, 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 well, first of all, they spur us on to discover more. And you just mentioned about something you that you've continued to discover. Exactly. Um, but, but sometimes they also hint at um, things that people have tried to conceal, which can also be very intriguing. Um, so I wonder if, uh, well, this must have been a, a sort of extraordinary journey, but um, I, I, I sort of wonder about the impact that it must have had on you and your relationships within the family. You mean writing the book itself or discovering the facts? I suppose both in a way, because they could go alongside one another. Well, writing the book itself has had really no particular impact because, you know, very sadly, by the time I got round to actually deciding to really write it, um, which I was very hesitant about doing. I mean, I have a sort of slight aversion to this endless confessional autobiography, but, you know, in the end, I couldn't, couldn't resist it myself. Um, uh, it didn't really have any impact on the family because by the time I got round to writing it, you know, the three sisters were no longer with us. Mm. Um, and the I rest of the family, um, I mean, not, not, um, I mean, Ozil's children are extremely interested in their, in their background, but, um, I don't think anybody, I mean, nobody has, you know, perhaps had as much interest as I have mm. and why that's the case. I don't know. I think it's partly because you know, I felt an enormously strong attraction precisely to this German heritage. So I needed to make my peace with it and find out and somehow immerse myself in what it might have been all about just through an act of imaginative understanding, so to speak. Yes, I actually, um, just about that, that point on imaginative understanding, what you will have needed to do, I suppose, knowing uh, the aunts towards the end of their life, you will have had to take an imaginative leap to what they were like during the war and also in the period after the war. So, you know, people don't stay static, of course. I mean, that's that's an obvious point, but you would, must have had to imagine them as they were, which can't can't have been a simple thing. No, I mean, but I think, you know, the, the art of writing about anything is to imagine your way into it. And uh, otherwise, you know, it always, it's kind of dead on the page. Um, and uh, and do you think they did change fundamentally the three sisters after the war? No, um, and I think that's the. I mean, they all made their lives, you know. And I think in my mother's case, without being you know, sort of too partial, I think you know, really quite outstandingly. I mean, you know, my mother was a. I mean, she was you know she had an extraordinary musical life, and she was friends with composers like Benjamin Britten and Michael Tippett, who I remember coming to our house. And because she had an extraordinary ability to sight read even 12 tone music, you know, she could help, she helped these composers to, I mean, she, she would take a look at the page and say, you know, this will work and this won't work and so on. She was, she was extremely talented and very driven and really went forward with her life. But on the other hand, None of them got over what happened to their father. None of them got over the loss of the old world, including the two sisters who stayed in Germany. I mean, they just found, you know, Germany had obviously moved on a lot. I mean, it has moved on an unbelievable amount. And, um, you know, that world was lost as we, as we know, um, the good bits as well as the bad bits. So none of them really moved on. I mean, one of the most striking examples of this was, uh, and Kim knows about this, was there was a building that my grandparents had invested in in Berlin that was expropriated in 1938, um, along with, there were other members, all of them, it turned out, relations who had co-invested in this. And, um, you know, after the wall fell in 
89, and then there was the re reunification, and then slowly these buildings emerged, you know, and their ownerships and so on, and there was a wave of restitution. And Orzel, the middle aunt, refused to accept, well, refused to acknowledge the process and refused even to accept the money. Now, you know, the one thing people usually do is they'll take the money. I mean, and it was not an insignificant sum. I mean, it was in six figures in Deutschmarks. So per, per sister. But she refused because the very act of taking the money was too painful and difficult a reminder of the past. And not least, which I remember very well, the idea of, you know, you had to obviously prove who you were. I mean, you, you know, I mean, uh, you had to go through the whole process of identifying yourself to German authorities. And that process for her was completely unacceptable. So she refused to hear about this restitution. She refused to talk about it. And, you know, this was one example of not moving on. Because in a sense, the very process of restitution, and this is a theme that runs right through my book, not just restitution of buildings, but, a, you know, obviously, I, you know, I was looking for the restitution of my father. There was the restitution of this firm Eichenberg. There's the whole question of the restitution of Germany to a refugee, to, of an original homeland. And this, this applies to refugees today from other places. I mean, every, when I was writing it, I felt a very strong echo with, you know, what's happening today. Uh, and the problems of being a refugee. But so restitution runs through the book. And there was a strong attempt to restitute the past, which of course is ultimately impossible. Uh, and one way, you know, as I say, to answer your question in which I felt was it absolutely exemplary of how the sisters hadn't moved on was the refusal by Ursula of this money. Yes, yes. Um... Uh, perhaps it is a, a good moment to ask a bit about that your title, How to Be a Refugee. And uh, what do you think What do you think are the echoes of today that, that emerge in the book? Well, I mean, obviously the title is playful. Uh, I mean, this is not a self-help book. And, you know, I have no, I mean, in a sense, it's a reference to how difficult it is to be a refugee um, mm -hmm. and to navigate, you know, cultures that, I mean, in geographical terms and also in historical terms are actually very close. So I always imagine how much more difficult it is for people who've come from very different parts of the world, you know, which are not part of Europe and uh, which don't share a language with so many common roots and so on. Mm -hmm. So the, the title is absolutely ironic and playful. Um, uh, I don't think but, that, um, yeah, go on. Well, I was just going to 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 sort of talk a, a bit more about this this question of of restitution and documents and the complexity of it all because it it just kind of got me thinking even ab about Ursula's story and the way that uh, you know when the Hink the whole Hinkle affair was was over she it didn't it wasn't the end for her and uh, she would you know um, it, it, it's it's difficult even to imagine what that that whole the thought of having to to produce documents would have would have triggered in her mind. And I suppose that's one of the things that I think about in the context of, of contemporary refugees, how humans who are infinitely complex get reduced to paperwork. Absolutely. And, you know, identity is infinitely complex. I mean, there is no such thing as, you know, I mean, what is a Jewish identity? What is a German identity? You know, there are so many strands to these enormously rich cultures and an identity is very much, you know, which strands you identify with and how you interpret them mm -hmm. in your overall self-conception. So it's it's a very difficult thing. And I agree with you. I mean, in a way, these days, especially with the, you know, with the kind of identity politics that we're in increasingly living with, I mean, identities are reduced to very simple terms and are assumed both often both by those within them, but also especially by those commenting from outside them, you know, that they refer to a rather monolithic experience. And of course they don't. Mm. And, you know, one of the problems of refugees is that they struggle to be understood because you're almost always seen in a very simplistic light, you know, and... Um, Absolutely. 
I, I thought I maybe would introduce a couple of other elements in the book which I found fascinating but which we haven't touched on yet. One of them is is Emmy's story and and uh, her complicated relationship to her to, to Jewishness. Um, and then the other thing was this, this the sort of the, the aristocracy and and the sure. uh, so I just wonder you know because there are elements that we well, haven't spoken the, about. Yeah. It might be interesting. For the benefit of everyone listening, obviously, who most of you or all of you won't have read the book, Emmy was my grandmother, um, so the mother of the three sisters and the mother of my mother, and she um, was she was only partially Jewish, but she was Jewish in the halakhic sense, in that her grandmother, um, and we think her grandfather, but that's obviously not relevant in the halakhic sense, were Jewish, um, though that was concealed. Um, but she told my mother, anyway, she told her daughters, but anyway, it was, she had a brother who was one of the most famous Catholic priests in Germany. He became Catholic, called Kaplan Fasel. If you Google him, you'll find plenty of stuff on him. And um, he, was a, he was a household name in Berlin. I mean, he gave lectures to thousands of people in packed halls on philosophy. Uh, was a convert to Catholicism, was a was translated Thomas Aquinas into German, I think in seven volumes or something, and wrote numerous other things. So, you know, this was a very complex background, and Emmy managed to pass herself off as entirely Aryan, uh, which was why she never really was, I mean, she... She had to survive the war like everybody else. But um, she was a very complex character who basically died when I was too young to really know her. But obviously I heard about her from, from her, her daughters and from my cousins who are all considerably older than I am. So, um, so that is Emmy, sorry. I was, and then to answer your second part of your question on the aristocracy, I mean, the aristocracy only comes in with Orzel. So Orzel, again, just to remind everyone, the middle sister who was the actress and was, you know, managed to get her certificate of Aryan identity out of Hinkle, through Hinkle. Once she got that certificate, she was able to, or, or that acceptance, I don't know if it was an actual certificate, but there was, anyway, she was able to marry her, her fiancé, who was an aristocrat from Westphalia by the name of Plettenberg. Um, and they married, I, believe, I think from memory, it's all in the book, from 1943, which meant that she was also able to go back to her, her acting work. And she actually returned to a the theater in Bremen where she'd been expelled all those years before. Um, but after a short period of time, she was outed, and to this day in the Einwohner Melderamt, you can see an entry that says the Gestapo came calling for her on a particular day in November. And somebody came up to her on a dark street in Bremen when she was going back from the theater. We don't know who this person was, but he came up to her and he said, we know who you are, you know, your cover's been blown, so to speak, and we would advise you, you, you would be well advised to leave the city immediately obviously a quote unquote nice person um, and uh, she left on foot dressed as a boy she went back to her changing room and put on a wig and you know dressed flattened her chest and and fled and she somehow got to Holland where her as I said before her new husband was in the Wehrmacht and she persuaded him to desert the army, which was a very big deal, obviously punishable by immediate death if you were found. And they hid in an attic in Holland, or in several attics, they had to move from time to time for the rest of the war. Okay. So that's how the arist aristocratic link comes in. So my aunt went from being, you know, an endangered species to becoming a countess of the German Reich. Yes. overnight by the stroke of a pen it's 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 fascinating to to hear those two things in um kind of juxtaposition because both uh, uh, the, the the sort of the inhabiting of kind of a catholic identity is kind of 
it, and also just the way in which Ursul was able to enter into this world of the aristocracy very fully. It kind of speaks a bit to what we were saying before about the complexities of identity, the way that people can invest themselves very deeply, even if it's complicated to do so or seemingly impossible to do so in new right. identities. Well, that's right. I mean, she had the identity of a German, a Jew, which she never, obviously, you, you cannot completely purge your memory, of an aristocrat, of an actress, which she really was to her last breath. I mean, she said it herself. She said, I, you know, I feel, she even wrote a kind of testament before she died in which she said that she feels she's constantly learning to inhabit roles, which I thought was exceedingly interesting. Mm. Um, and, you know, and she made sure that only the right people knew about, well, to, to come to the point, it, she and her husband made sure that the family into which she married never learnt about her Jewish origins. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know it for decades after the war. So this is another respect in which things didn't change. I mean, after, after the war, you know, I mean, maybe it took, I guess it was only in the 70s or 80s that, you know, people that Germany really faced up to what had gone on. But, um, you know, it was fine to be Jewish, so to speak. I mean, in fact, it was at some point even a fashion statement. Uh, I think it no longer is, but it certainly was at one point. And, uh, you know, the hermetic silence on that issue within the aristocratic circle remained as complete as ever. I mean, we're talking about well into the 80s. Yes. Well, I, I suppose these, these stories do not have sort of easy and clean endings. And in, in, in the case of uh, Germany facing up to its past, I think even just this year, we've had the amendment to the law on obtaining citizenship where the, the, uh, the exclusions, which were pretty um, uh, harsh in some cases. So, for example, through adopt if, if um, uh, in cases of adoptive parents, um, descendants of Jewish refugees were not able to uh, obtained a German citizenship again. This has now very recently been uh, changed in German law. So this story is in a sense not over. And I'd, I'd really be interested in, uh, of course, a lot of this book is about how you feel about Germany in a way. Um, so I just wonder what, when you think about Germany now and think about the future we're living in, I suppose, uncertain and dangerous times, what does the future feel like for you and, and how has this experience informed how you look at the present and the future? Just to ask a really easy question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I would, you know, that's an enormous question, uh, especially when it comes to the future. I mean, obviously, you know, Germany, I mean, there's nothing new to say there's a cliche has had an absolutely remarkable uh, with its past and understanding of its past. And, you know, perhaps even too much its acceptance of its kind of the sense of all, the, the automation of guilt has become a part of the German identity and enables it to find a new energy for the future, which is kind of a remarkable achievement. It's an extraordinary mm. achievement. Um, I mean, you know, it's obviously becoming an intensely pluralistic society. I mean, out of all recognition, I mean, in the last just 10 or 15 years, um, it's, you know, it is now, I, I don't remember the numbers, others will know it, but I mean, it's, uh, you know, in a sense, it's reckoning with the past and it's, has created the basis, you know, of a very remarkable society and, and one that is becoming increasingly pluralistic in every sense of the word. I mean, not just, you know, just statistics, but I mean, people's daily acceptance uh, of difference. Mm. So, you know, I think it's a very remarkable country and um, I, couldn't agree more. Um, I, mean, I can't I just... predict the future any more than anyone else can. But I think that if any country has a, you know, has a stable future as a pluralistic, liberal and tolerant society, it's probably Germany. And, you know, the kind of, the kind of um, mystery for me is why the 
Anglo-Saxon countries, which were the beacons of tolerance and pluralism, have become in many ways, you know, so intolerant um, and, and so ideologically divided. But that's a whole different question. So I would say, you know, maybe I have too rosy a view of, of this, but... Uh, well, you know, I don't, that, I don't think so view. necessarily. I, I certainly agree with you about pluralism. I, I, I suppose I just have perhaps... Um, I'm sure you also share concerns about the rise of the far right across Europe, and this is not something yes, of that it doesn't exist in Germany. And even just this weekend, there was a, an, an article uh, in The Economist about um, about with, uh, the issues with, with far right extremism with, uh, within the Bundeswehr. And so I, I suppose I completely agree with you about pluralism. Um, but of course, uh, we none of us would want to be complacent uh, in the face of the threat of the far right, and I'm sure that's something you completely agree with. But perhaps this is a good moment actually to bring in Kim, because she is joining us from Germany, and <laughs> it certainly uh, would be great to, to hear her thoughts and reflections on the conversation. Just before I hand over to you, Kim, I do want to remind the audience that there will be a chance for Simon to answer your questions. So please do uh, post your questions in the chat. And we will come to Simon after hearing from Kim to, to have answers to your questions. So over to you, Kim. Yeah, thank you, Toby. And thank you, Simon. Um, this is really an incredible moment for me. Um, your book captivates me on so many levels. <laughs> Firstly, as a, as a reader, and I think here I can confirm also Toby's reading experience is really turning page after page following you into this extremely well-written story of, of, of how you unravel family secrets and how you wrestle you. Uh, with history. Um, and then it captivates me as a teacher. Um, I immediately see the potential of your book and in, in, in leading students, and some of my students are here tonight, um, into this kind of larger history of refuge and migration, while at the same time, it demonstrates why history matters, I think. And, and then on a, on a personal note, um, as your former research assistant, I'm uh, really impressed how this project has developed and, and how you have so skillfully woven the many stories um, into a compelling narrative. I recognize individual bits and pieces right. and, and aspects that, that we looked at back then and, and now they found their place in this like colorful mosaic and intriguing narrative. So congratulations, first of all, it's, it's amazing. I owe a lot to you. <laughs> So let me make uh, three very brief concluding um, points. Uh, the first one's about history, in particular German Jewish history. Um, the second one's about memory. And the third one, which you've already discussed, is about our own present and, and future. So in this book, we, we get to know a family, the Liedges from Berlin, who lived through the turbulent, indeed catastrophic years of the 1930s and 1940s in ways I think that are different from what we would expect. Um, and in the account, the three sisters, Simon's mother and uh, his aunts, surprise us most. Um, although they fell under the enemy definition of Nazi racial ideology, you could say that they kind of trick their fate by denying uh, their, their Jewish uh, roots. Uh, a staggering boldness, a defiance, perhaps maybe also kind of stubbornness, uh, combined with the most self-confident transgressing of boundaries that their traditional gender roles uh, also set them. Yeah. So this fascinates us when, when we read about uh, the three sisters. Uh, German Jewish history in modern times is a history of diversity, a uh, history of heterogeneity. The Liedkes, like other families, embarked on this trajectory that we heard of, of acculturation, of integration, of something that we call Verbürgerlichung, in, in German. Yeah. So the conversion to Christianity was seen as this entry ticket, this entree billet uh, into majority society to quote Heinrich Heine's uh, famous words and also his personal experience. Uh, Simon, you mentioned Rahel Farnhagen. Um, we could also mention the children and grandchildren of uh, philosopher Moses Mendelssohn who would also convert to, to Christianity. Uh, the Weimar Republic uh, keeps fascinating us. Um, it held out this, this kind of special promise of social equality and full civil rights. Um, I think of Peter Gay, who has analyzed it as the period in which the former cultural outsiders, as, as he calls them, of imperial Germany um, flourish and reinvent themselves as insiders and, and as very much uh, shaping a new culture. And, and Simon revives this in his book, uh, for us, we think of the, the family flat in Blumershof, uh, 
as well, uh, the space of, of culture and, and, and ideals that are very uh, dear to bourgeois circles. Um, but there were other circles too, and, and they chose different ways of trying to overcome a, a very troubled reality in which, uh, despite all of the achievements of Weimar, there was anti-Semitism very much uh, alive, and these other paths could lead to socialism, um, and for very, very few in Germany also to Zionism. But I want to mention another part, and that is um, the law. Um, and I would like to speak about Ernst Liedtke, uh, for a second, Simon's grandfather, who, as we've heard, died in Berlin in 1933 after being expelled from his profession as a lawyer. Uh, for him, I imagine there could not have been a greater humiliation than being ousted from uh, practicing uh, the law, which for many jurists of Jewish roots was much, much more than a profession. It was part of their uh, identity. Um, so I was reminded of uh, Ludwig Bendix, another Ber Berlin lawyer born in 1877, who was he was only two years younger than Ernst Liedtke, and Bendix described himself as um, a legal fanatic. <laughs> uh, his son, the sociologist Reinhard Bendix, recalled, and I quote, uh, his commitment to the law was uh, much more than a choice of career. It was a dedication to German culture and society in place of his family's traditional commitment to Judaism, the practice of the law became his way of life. And, and perhaps you could say that for Ernst and, and for many others from this professional cohort. So let me get to the second point, that's memory. Uh, Simon's book is important because it writes a different kind of German Jewish history, a history that kind of blurs the lines between a all too simplifying us and them thinking. It reads German Jewish history against the grain in what I think is a very refreshing way, perhaps similar to uh, Moshe Zimmermann's study that also refuses to use this kind of binary of Jewish and non-Jewish. And Zimmermann speaks of Germans against Germans, so stressing that there were Germans declaring war on other Germans. Um, once everything got out of control in Nazi Germany, nothing could be expected or predicted. And yet, time and again, we, are drawn to construct these kind of teleological narratives uh, when we think about the Nazi era, kind of history that backshadows the Holocaust and condemns those who were, in our comfortable hindsight view, apparently uh, too blind to see the writing on the wall. So we tend to read more plan, more system, more intention into also the perpetrators' acts, which uh, were to a large extent driven, as we know, also by uncoordinated dynamics, scrambles and skirmishes that radicalized Nazis big and small to eagerly work uh, towards the Führer, to quote Ian Kershaw's famous phrase. So I think what I want to say is that there was surely no regular experience of, of Nazism and the Holocaust uh, when nothing was certain anymore, anything was possible, even surviving the Holocaust in Berlin, while close family members such as Simon's great uncle Theodor Liedtke, whom we haven't mentioned yet, um, uh, was deported and, and murdered. So in the light of what we expect, we then reading the book are irritated or confused to find maybe agency so great as that um, um, of the three sisters. But then Simon says, uh, rightly in the prologue, who are we to judge uh, from our peasant, present day uh, perspective? So too often, I think uh, we think we know everything. We've heard it all. Perhaps too often we, we struggle with a kind of ritualized memory, with canonized narratives of victimhood. And at the same time, we are alarmed. And you've touched on this, um, seeing our consensus of memory eroding. Uh, if not under all out attack uh, from those who so desperately want to draw the final line under it all. And the book denies us any easy coming to terms with the past. Uh, we have many questions to discuss, uh, complex issues uh, to solve uh, both in the German, but I think also in the British uh, context. And this leads me to the last point about our own present and future. I'm very glad that Simon has decided to make his own voice so strongly heard uh, in the book. Um, it is a family history, but it's also a very personal account of the difficulty, I think, to find one's place when one could neither leave an old world from which family has come, nor arrive in a new world where the family has found uh, refuge. So we encounter this first generation of, of, of continental Britons, 
from Central Europe um, who feel gratitude towards the host country and at the same time they mourn the painful losses um, um, uh, caused by, by expulsion. Um, but we also hear in the book from the next generation uh, who struggles uh, with uh, what if Umlauf, a child survivor and psychotherapist has termed Gefühlserbschaften. So this kind of emotional inheritance of survival and refuge that can be um, overwhelming. And uh, Simon uh, allows us to see some of these, these struggles that he confronted. And here, and this is really to conclude, I think the book joins similarly daring attempts to break with what maybe is a taboo. Uh, the children of survivors may not only feel love and respect, but also anger, sometimes disappointment uh, towards their parents. Um, I'm thinking of Maya Lasko walfisch in her book, Letters to Breslau, in which she speaks very openly about that kind of state of permanent emotional upheaval and confusion in which uh, she grew up, her longing to be like other children. Um, and due to my current work on visual storytelling, I also think of Art Spiegelman's Mouse, uh, in which the artist uh, wrestles with his survivor parents, in particular with his father. So it takes great courage to write about these troubled emotional inheritances, these Gefühls Erbschaften. And at the same time, I, I immensely value uh, the effort as, as a very meaningful way to carry this history into the future and, and to make really crystal clear why, why it matters. So um, I want to thank you again, Simon. Thank you. Brilliant summary. Brilliant comments. Absolutely. Actually, I don't know, Simon, if before we get to the questions, did you want to say anything in response to the comments? Well, I mean, they're so rich. I mean, I, it could take me an hour to reply if I can even think of all the points I want to make. But I mean, I just a couple very, uh, perhaps a little randomly. Firstly, I strongly agree with Kim that there is a kind of us and them narrative. There are acceptable ways of remembering the tragedies we're talking about, both among Jews worldwide, specifically among the descendants of refugee families, but also I have to say very much on the German side. And if I have any frustration, it's that um, I have found to a degree that uh, Germans, I hate generalization, so I'm not quite sure now who I'm talking about specifically, but that there is a resistance to hearing anything other than the accepted narrative of what happened to Jews and how Germans should feel about it. And in a, in a certain way, you know, the particular culture of memory that has grown up in Germany, which has been absolutely admirable in all the ways that I've said and that many other people have said, has also led to a sort of rather ossified, I even find slightly sort of constricting narrative. And I would feel the same if I were German, German, if you know what I mean, um, that, you know, I cannot break through somehow. I mean, uh, I mean, for the most part, people just, you know, find it very uncomfortable that there were, that there is another narrative and that there is this conflicted and complex relation to Jewish heritage and to German heritage. There are the victims and there are the persecutors. And there's a, and I, I would be grateful if the day came when we could have a slightly more complex discussion about it, but it seems to be, there's a lot of resistance to it. So I totally endorse what Kim said and have personally experienced this on multiple occasions. Uh, it's like banging your head against a wall. Um, in fact, it's a it's almost like a perverse situation because it's almost where the descendants of those who were persecuted are not allowed to question the narrative on the German side, so to speak. Uh, I think that's that's probably the main thing that I would say. Just a tiny gloss on, um, and then an answer to a question in the chat. Um, just to say that. You know, the way, and again, this is, I think, relevant, the way that um, my grandfather was expelled was complicated. So he was expelled at once, and that looked like it was totally clear in April 33. But then he was invited back, and he went back to the court. And I, it happened twice, certainly, that he was expelled and then invited back. And each time he returned, his role was more limited until finally he was not allowed to appear in court. He could only do, so to speak, 
office work behind the scenes. So it was a it was a total, to put it mildly, a total roller coaster. And I think this was not infrequent, and it's not actually often appreciated. So again, the narrative is thrown out, end of story. You know, you you then emigrate or you face the consequences. And it wasn't that simple. So there was this constant sense of hope. And I think that's one of the things that that destroyed him um, was, you know, having the hope raised and then having it abandoned, refusing really to see what was happening, which my grandmother did much better. She was absolutely clear from the beginning that Hitler was not going to be temporary and was for real. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize that point. And then the final point to make, because somebody asked in the chat, um, you know, to know something about my father, and I don't want to take too much time to talk about this, but basically my father, um, who was, you know, was also a German Jew, uh, but but from a, it's much more straightforward, so to speak. I mean, he was from a religious family. He himself was the first generation. By the way, a very interesting example of how quickly assimilation happened because I've been to the graveyard in Trier, which I actually hadn't seen until quite recently. The first time I went was in the year of Brexit. Nothing to do with Brexit. I happened to be giving a lecture in Bonn, but I decided to go, which I'd never done before, and I don't understand it. And, you know, I just realized from the gravestones, which are very long and detailed, there's even a big book about this graveyard, you know, that this was a family of extremely religious people. They were rabbis, moles, um, Torah scholars, and so on, for generations. And then bang, suddenly, and they're called, you know, Moshe and so on. My great grandfather's called Moshe. And then suddenly his son is called Ferdinand. And he leaves the community, which was only 500. I assumed it was far bigger, but I learned it was only 500 at the time. And he goes to Cologne and he becomes, instead of becoming a Torah scholar like his ancestors, he becomes a traveling ribbon salesman in the Rhineland. And, you know, the mystery to me is that this could, and this is again a fascinating illustration of what assimilation, how it was experienced at the time. I mean, there was no conversion, that was out of the question, absolutely out of the question. But the idea that a traveling ribbon salesman could be a step up from being a Bible scholar and a rabbi and a teacher is to me quite incomprehensible. And one really has to, again, to use that phrase of imaginative entry, one has to imagine oneself back into somehow into the times to even just grasp how this could be, how this could be possible. And then he gave birth to my father, uh, who might or might not have even had a bar mitzvah, we don't know. And, uh, you know, and then he, again, came far too, he emigrated far too late. I mean, he literally left in the last minute and got out by the skin of his teeth. Apparently, he always said, so my half-brother tells me from his first marriage, uh, with the most terrifying journey of his life. He went to Switzerland and then somehow got to England. Anyway, so that's a very brief summary of who my father was. He then started, a, he had very little education. He started a brush factory in the UK and became, you know, quite successful and, um, but died very young. Well, I think that's an amazing illustration of the additional depths and uh, uh, it, the fascinating stories that are are there in your book and it's been lovely to also see the the comments from people in addition to the questions i'm really glad that people have enjoyed this discussion and i've no doubt that many people will be inspired to read or indeed reread actually from the discussion your your fantastic book how to be a refugee so it, it just ends for me to say uh, thank you uh, also to Kim for your, your yeah. concluding remarks, which I found fascinating, and Brilliant. also for working with us at the library to bring this event together, but especially to Simon for writing this book and also for joining us this evening. Thank you, Simon. Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope everyone has a very good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.